Right. Okay. Tell me about the claim. Uh, so K2 uh, took place this summer. It was my third season. Um, every season I had progressed one camp higher, which always gave me hope. Um, and that was important. But this year we managed to break through, which was incredible. Um, our summit day was, was incredibly tense. Um, we had a 16-hour uh, you know, summit bid to that final 1,000 meters. Um, it was incredibly deep snow. We had a, a, a lot of precipitation, um, really, really uh, low temperatures, and you know, um, just really, really a tough day, I'd say, overall. Um, but we did get there, and um, I, I think of it a little bit like Dante's Inferno. Um, but at the very, very top, we managed to get a bluebird day, so it was wonderful when we managed to get to the very, very top because the sky opened up and we had an amazing blue sky um, where we were able to take some pictures and then uh, head down, but we did head down at night, which is always very dangerous. Um, There were 12 of us that summited, including myself and another uh, Chinese female, and um, we were the only team this year that summited. And K2 previously had not been summited since 2014, Um, so which is not unusual. Um, if I look back, um, there's been 13 years since 1986 of no summits. So that means that in any one year, there's a 40% chance of, of no summit. And Vanessa, you're really old. I mean, you're nearly as old as me. And <laughs> Thank you for that. One in four people, they, they <laughs> die on the way down. Why on earth do you want to do this? You know, I think, I think there's probably three good reasons somebody would do this. Um, one, uh, to show that they can, if they're that way inclined. Uh, two is to, um, to to bring a message up. So for me, I was bringing um, not only the Union Jack, but I brought um, UN Women. It was important for me to bring UN Women to the top to show how far women have come, um, you know, in this day and age. Um, the other reason would be to, to do something like scientific research. Um, you know, taking glacier samples, things like that. Um, it's hard for people to get that high to take samples, and uh, mountaineers are great resources for scientists. Uh, you know, I love the stories, or I, well, I hate the stories, but love the stories of mountaineers, you know, going past the, the dead bodies of other mountaineers, which has happened on Everest, and you went past many of the graves, didn't you? Yeah, unfortunately, um, every year, especially as the glaciers start to melt, uh, more and more of those... Um, you know, they're, they're not full bodies because of the way the mountain um, flushes itself with avalanche. But there's body parts, of course. Mm. What's that like? I mean, that just gives you a little glimpse into your life, doesn't it? Well, of course. I mean, it's, there's nothing more sobering, um, you know, to see something like that. And, you know, I think whenever I come across something like that, I, I always pause and, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give that a, a, a proper... A, b- a proper burial if I'm in a place where I can take it to the Gilkey Memorial, which is a, 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 m- a memorial at the base of K2, I will. If not, I'll have to um, give it a burial at, in a glacier. Um, but it's uh, it's very sobering, and there's 84 people who have died on, on K2, um, yet less than 400 summits. So it's, um, you know, it's an incredibly tough mountain. Um, that's why it gets its name, the Savage Mountain. Um, and only twenty pe- only only twenty women have stood on the summit. Yet, somewhere like Everest, there's four hundred and eighty nine women. It, it must be an amazing feeling. I'm just wondering, though. You know, it's Scotland's nine degrees today. And I think you were coping with minus forty. And when you're on the top of these mountains, if it's only what is it, 200 metres or so shorter than Everest, and you said you had a great day. So you've climbed all the way up there with oxygen. You're at 29,000 feet roughly, which is on the way up to where jet engines fly. Then you have a look around you. Can you remember what that was like? Yeah, I can. Um, you know, I, I, I believe strongly in, in using oxygen, and I know, um, you know a lot of climbers choose not to. Um, for me, 
We use oxygen at a two-liter flow rate, you know, mixed with ambient air. And just so your viewers understand, that's not the oxygen you take in a hospital. You know, the oxygen you take in a hospital is, is pure oxygen. Our oxygen is mixed with ambient air, so it's, it's, it's very little. But it, what it does do is it, it, it helps warm just the very, very tips of your fingers and toes. And when you get caught in severe weather... Uh, for a very, very long time in somewhere like the death zone, which is above 8,000 meters or 26,000 feet, um, you need that added protection um, because you do risk things like frostbite. Um, and for for me, you know, I it, it's kind of a non-negotiable. Um, you know, I, I don't want to come back a cripple and I don't want to come back um, a statistic. And so... You know, that's something that I always feel is, is, a, is a safety marker. Um, you know, so we, we met just terrible whiteout conditions. I mean, there's video that shows and proves just how terrible the weather was. And by the way, this was our weather window, so you can just hmm. imagine what a non-weather window provides. <laughs> um, and only did that weather window break ironically, right on the summit, which is why I kind of call it the Dante's Inferno, because I feel like we did kind of go through a little bit of, you know, terrible conditions, but we did get to the top and have that, that break. But I, of course, I remember it. It was, it was beautiful, but also very, very hard to, um, to have that wind coming at you and that snow coming at you and to be sinking, you know, up to your knees. Um, and, and in that blizzard, it, it, there's no other way to describe it but a blizzard. Um, and you're going uphill. So, you know, I, I completely respect all the other teams for turning around. But as I looked around my team, we had people who had been to the North and South Pole. We had people who, you know, um, live in Iceland. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, that says everything. Um, you know, people who, who had come from China and who had climbed uh, 13, 8,000 meter peaks, you know, who were extremely experienced. So I, I was blessed with probably the most experienced team I had ever, ever climbed with. Um, and I think that really made the difference. I know that you had to eat baby food because your protein bars froze. You, you, it's a long line of record-breaking achievements for you. First woman to achieve a Guinness World Record for climbing the highest peak in every continent in the shortest period of time. You skied to the last degree at both the North and South Poles. You've climbed five peaks over 8,000 meters, including Everest. I, I'm just Conscious, though, just try and explain to me and the listeners the life lesson for you in climbing a hill. What does it teach you? Does it teach you that you're fragile? Does it teach you that you're tough? Does it teach you that you need people? Does it teach you the world's a great place? What do you learn when you climb one of these hills? Well, it really teaches you patience, and it teaches you that you're not in control. Um, you know, I think when you when you start out, you think, okay, yes, you know, I can do this. I'm strong, and you know, I can, you know, plan the logistics, and you know, I can do all these great things around leadership and teamwork. And but the reality is, is when you're when you're um, working with nature, there, there's a whole lot of uncontrollables. Um, so really, what the mountains teach you is that you're not in control, and you have to really be flexible around things like nature, around weather, um, around illnesses, you know, um, high altitude illnesses, and, um, you know, really be adaptable uh, much more than you would um, in, a, in an office environment um, because the, the conditions are much more extreme. Um, and you have to take those into consideration if you want to be successful. Lovely. Thank you. I've stopped recording. Actually, that's what everybody, you know, if I speak to underwater cameramen, they all say the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> you take nature lightly, you're in trouble. Oh, gosh, you know, she's, she's a force. She is. Thank you so much. Okay, lovely to bye speak bye, with bye. you. Bye. Bye.